All right, so Genesis chapter 4 starts off with Adam and Eve. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife. We know if you spend any time in the Old Testament, that is that means that he didn't just meet her right now, right? He knew her, as in had sexual relations with Eve, and um, it says she conceived and bore Cain and said... I have acquired a man from the Lord. So this is an interesting idea. Like everybody up to this point, Adam and Eve, were created, right? God created them out of the dust. Adam was made out of the side. Eve was created. And here now we have the first birth. We have the first pregnancy. Now, like you know, pregnancy on its own is kind of crazy, right? You, you, you're just like, I remember my sister really did not want to be pregnant. She was like, I don't know, this whole thing, like, I think she saw that alien movie, you know, and just felt like this thing growing in my stomach. I don't know how this is. Can you imagine just for a second, especially, you know, if, if you've been pregnant and you've had a baby, like, can you imagine being the first person ever to go through this? You have no, like, Adam is absolutely no help whatsoever. And here you are, like, having this pregnancy and going through this whole thing it's amazing it's an amazing miracle and eve recognizes that this man i have requ- i have acquired a man from the lord is a gift from god and that, there's a sweet just truth that our children are gifts from the lord but specifically here, this is the first one, and this is a very rare usage of the word. He, she says, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Like, you, most of the time through the rest of Scripture, babies are not referred to as men, right? She, she recognizes, though, that she, he or she is something new, something different. She has a man. She has, she has created, in a sense, right? She has received this, this new human and she says, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Now, Adam and Eve are going to have many children, but the focus of this chapter is on the, their three, these three specific children that we're going to look at this evening or see in the next, this and the next chapter. So here she has Cain. He grows up. It says, verse 2, then she bore again, this time his brother Abel. And then it gives us a little description. Abel was a keeper of sheep, so he's a shepherd. Cain was a tiller of the ground. So if you're from Tustin, Tustin Tillers right there, um, a farmer. So you've got the shepherd and the farmer, the, the father of these um, you know, agricultural lifestyles happening right here. Abel being the keeper of the sheep. Cain, tiller of the ground. He's that farmer, likes to get in the dirt and, you know, grow things we'll see kind of how that plays later verse three and in the process of time it came to pass that cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the lord abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat and the lord respected abel and his offering but he did not respect cain and his offering and cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So let's just talk about this. this. is really interesting. This is the first occasion of worship. Remember we talked about new beginnings or beginnings in Genesis, how it's full of beginnings. This is the first incident of worship. They're bringing what they have created in a sense or made or produced. So one brings the fruit of the ground because he is a farmer and one brings the fruit of the field or the flock rather because he's a shepherd. Um, and And yet Abel, Cain, it says, brings his, it seems to be first, um, the fruit of the ground. But then Abel also brought the firstborn of his flock. It doesn't appear to be this, this is the first time necessarily, because it says in the process of time. So it, it seems to be this may have been like a regular thing, the process of time, just as things were going, they had a relationship with God in this sense. And, and so even outside, you know, driven out of the Garden of Eden, they still are worshiping. So they come to worship, they come to give an offering. It's interesting, though, is that God didn't receive one of the offerings. Now, it's, it's interesting to me because, you, you know, I mean, honestly, you kind of have the feeling of like, whatever I give to the Lord, 
he is going to be good with, right? Like, I, you know, I, this, is, this is what I've got, and this is what I'm bringing, and God's going to be, uh, should be thankful that I'm even giving this, right? It's an interesting dynamic to, to realize, like, are there times that you and I have brought something, have offered something, have given something to the Lord, and, and the Lord's like, eh, no thanks. <laughs> like, nah, that's not, that's not what I'm looking for. And so then the question is, what is he looking for? Why? Why does he accept one and reject another? And a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about this. Um, I'm not going to get too deep into opinions, but I am going to look at Scripture because that's the best place to go. So what else does the Bible tell us about this occasion? What else can we learn um, about this incident? Saying that the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect or regard Cain and his offering. Somehow, the standard of God was not met by Cain, and God didn't receive it. There's something that God is looking for and something that God is willing to accept, and he doesn't just take everything. Now, many people have kind of guessed it's because one brought an animal and one brought a vegetable. Like, God likes meat, and you brought <laughs> a veggie burger, and that's not going to cut it. Um, we don't have any, there's no record. That's just an inference. That's a guess. I don't think it's a biblical idea. There's, there's no offering system set up. There, we don't have any record of any of that, you know, what you can bring. In fact, later, even in the Old Testament, you could bring grain offerings, right? You could bring a grain offering. You could bring a dove. You could bring a, you know, all kinds of different offerings are given to the Lord. So I don't think this is about the animal or the vegetable, but if you look in Hebrews chapter 11, you find that this does come up. This is referenced in that famous hall of faith section of Hebrews. And it says, by faith, Abel offered up a more excellent sacrifice. So I think that there's two aspects of this. One is by faith. I think that's the first and the most important thing. We know that without faith, it is impossible to please God. So if we're giving offerings without faith, God's like, yeah, I not interested don't need it don't want it you know there's a, a, a famous not famous i don't know depends on who you are but there's a, a there's a line from a song from you two that says uh bono says something like the god i know isn't short of cash mister <laughs> in the sense of like it god doesn't need your money he wants your faith he wants your heart he wants that purity of heart Right, so by faith, Abel offered up. So there's an offering, and it's by faith. But then he says, a more excellent sacrifice. Something better, something greater. And that sacrifice was the sacrifice of faith. It's a better offering to give by faith. It's a more excellent sacrifice to sacrifice by faith. So... You know, was Abel bringing first fruits? You see that in the scripture, right? First fruits. Or was Cain bringing, you know, the leftovers? It says that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and the fat. And, and that's like a, 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 an excellent sacrifice. Maybe, you know, Abel's like, or maybe Cain was like, well, here's some, you know, here's some bruised melons or <laughs> you know, leftover whatever and bring. Maybe he's bringing leftover. We don't really know. But we know that one is the firstborn of the flock and the other is the fruit of the ground. And I would say the key later comes that God infers Cain and Abel know. So even though we may not know, the point isn't what it was. We know because it's applicable to us that it's by faith we should make offerings. It's by faith we, could, we should give to the Lord. It's by faith I should sacrifice. I'm not, I'm not offering or sacrificing or even worshiping out of manipulation, out of uh, uh, trying to get something. We don't really know what his motive was, but we know that it doesn't seem to be by faith. Something, though, I think is revealed in our hearts when we bring the first and the best, right? There's this, there's this of like, hey, I, I, I saved for this. You know, I bought this. We were talking this morning or this afternoon, rather. I had a little staff meeting, and a lot of times I'll ask like strange 
icebreaker kind of questions just to kind of get conversations going and get to know each other a little bit and the question today was like what was your first car what was the first car what was the story behind it right um, kind of an interesting thought. How many of you guys can think of your first car right now? Right off the bat, you're like, oh, first car. I remember what that was. I remember that, you know, my, my first car is 500 bucks. Audi Fox. Rotted out seats, AM radio. Stick shift. Didn't know how to drive a stick shift. Figured it out, right? And so there's, there's those times where you buy something, right? And, and it's, it has a value. There's other times where it's just like somebody's like, cast away you don't really care about it you know you maybe you got passed down the you know family station wagon you're like eh. <laughs> you know like uh, you take care of it because you bought it you've, you've you're giving something that value and and there's that aspect of giving to the lord something that has value remember david was like hey i'm not gonna i'm not gonna offer something to the lord that i haven't you know purchased or paid for i'm not gonna have that be part of my sacrifice or my worship um so there's some interesting ideas there um the faithless giving aspect um, and here's here's what i think is interesting because you you begin to see the heart of cain in his response to god like you can you you know it smells rotten but you cut it open you see what's inside and you can see that cain is not in a good place right something is going on in his heart something is going on i would say even in his relationship with god and the thing I think that's important is faith and giving, worship, sacrifice. These are all relational ideas. These all have to do with relationship. I don't sacrifice for someone that I typically don't have care for or honor to or, you know, any, any of those kind of like relational aspects. And, and, and so the giving shouldn't just be duty it shouldn't just be a religious obligation it should be worship it, it should be love it should be faith and and so i just want to just a minute or two about this idea of of giving right what we give to the lord whether it's time um, treasure talent you know we talk about those kinds of things i'll give a quick plug for high school they really need you to give a week to go to hume if you're interested, we need some Hume counselors. So you want to give a week? There's a, there's a way to give by faith. <laughs> right? There's, there's, there is, though, things that we give. We give our time. We give our treasure. We give our talent. Um, why do we give should be out of love, out of faith, out of thankfulness. There should, the, the worship should be an overflow of the relationship. That's really what worship should be. Worship should be an overflow of the relationship. I'm not trying to stir it up so that I can get something. I'm not trying to do it. You know, I'm not, okay, I'm writing a big check this week because I really need a blessing. Right? That's not, that's, no, no person would, would appreciate that. And I don't think God, the Lord does necessarily either. But out of your heart of worship, out of your heart of faith, out of the overflow of your relationship. And then you may say, well, what? What am I supposed to give? Here's, here's 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. 2 Corinthians 9, 7 says, Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. It's very possible Cain was not a cheerful giver. I mean, we'll, we'll see soon what Cain is like. <laughs> like, he, he, he probably didn't go from, like, cheerful giving to, like, murder, you know, in, in a short period of time. Like, I'm, I don't know if he was a cheerful giver, but that's what the Lord loves. He's like, listen, if you're going to give to me, like, not begrudgingly, not under compulsion, not reluctantly, like, love me. I love to give. I, I remember the first time that I had a job and a girlfriend at the same time and i bought things for my girlfriend and i just thought it was the coolest thing i was like wow this is so cool like i i like to give like that is a it's out of relationship and that's what second corinthians is talking about here like decide in your heart once you want to give what you want to offer and offer to the lord cheerfully 
And then the last, the last thing about giving is giving is living by faith, right? Giving is living by faith. When, when Jesus is, 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 is watching the people come in and bring their offering into the temple, do you remember the one that he remarked about, right? Was it the, was it the guy who dropped in all the coins? That was the, the widow's might, right? It was just that little like, wow, oh, she, that, wow. Like his whole scale system is not the same as ours. Psalm 4 verse 5 says, Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in the Lord. We'll see that Cain didn't offer the right sacrifice, whether it was because of his faith or his heart However that, however that played out, we'll see here in just a second. But giving is living a life by faith. It's saying like, God, I trust you. I, I appreciate you. I'm, I'm following you. I, I want to see what you want to do with, with my life, with my talent and treasure and all of those things. You can see immediately his reaction when God doesn't receive it. And you know how it is when you know, when you're having an interaction with somebody and you, you can see their reaction, when, when you don't maybe do what they want you to do and they flare, right? Like, his reaction, the Lord's like, mm, nope, sorry, that's not what I'm looking for. Cain isn't like, oh, Lord, what, what's wrong? Like, how, how can I, what, t- show me. Show me my heart, like, tell me what's going on, like, how, I want to be right with you, I, I thought this was what you wanted, like, that's not his heart, right? He is what? Angry. He's upset, he's angry, like, how dare you not receive my offering? And then it says his face fell. <laughs> is that an interesting description? He was not a poker player, Cain. <laughs> he did not have a poker face, he was like, Right? Like God's like, no, sorry, that's not what I'm looking for. And he's like, what? Look at look at what happens. Look at God's reaction. Verse 6. So the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? (laughs) It's like I can see you're pretty upset. Why? Why are you angry? Remember we talked about this before? God asks questions because questions start conversations. And conversations help relationships. He is not, get that look off your face. Do you want me to wipe that face? Do you want me to, <laughs> right? Like that's not, <laughs> you want me to slap that fa- look off your face? Like, nope. He just says, why are you angry? And then look at this. Why has your countenance fallen? <laughs> What's the matter? And verse seven gives us a huge clue. If you do well, will you not be accepted? So there was some clarity. Like he didn't even have to bring it up. You know how when you're having some conversation with somebody and and everybody knows, like maybe you're outside the circle or you show up at the family and and you don't don't know the expectation, but everybody knows like, oh, you're sitting in dad's seat. Uh (laughs) Uh-oh, right? Like if you do well, Will you not be accepted? See, this wasn't the first time that they had brought an offering, it doesn't seem like. And God is like, listen, you, you know how this works. Like, you know what I'm looking for. Will you not be accepted if you do what's well? Yeah, you will. And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. And its desire is for you. But you should rule over it. Isn't this interesting? Right, this is, the, this is what's playing out in Cain's heart. God looks inside. He can see his anger. He can see it on his face. His countenance has fallen. And he's like, listen, I'm going to tell you. There's something going on inside. Sin is lying at the door. Like Sin is looking ready to pounce on you. Right, you've ever hidden behind the door? Like waiting to scare someone. Come on, let's just have a moment of honesty. You've ever hidden behind the door, right? Scare your wife or your mom or your husband. I don't know. Do wives scare husbands like that? Just anybody? Usually it's not that. Sin 
Sorry, guys. Sin is also hiding at the door, right? And it's an interesting picture. Sin lies at the door. What is it waiting for? An opening. Just open the door a little bit, Cain. How's he opening the door? I will say first, he brought the wrong offering. He knew the right offering. If you do well, he knew the right offering. He didn't bring it. He gets called on it. He's like, mm, no, nope, not what we're looking for. And he's angry. See, that, that is beginning, the, the door is starting to crack, right? And sin is just waiting. Sin lies at the door, and its desire is for you. Do you remember last week when we talked about the woman's desires for her husband? This is the same desire. <laughs> it's not desire like, hey, baby, I really want you. It's like, hey, I, I want to be over you. I want to rule. It says, you should rule over it, but its desire is to rule over you. Sin wants to rule over us. That's, that's how it works. That's how sin works. Sin is it's like a dangerous animal waiting to attack. You know, talks, you know like, Scripture talks about like Satan is a, like a, a lion, right? Looking for whom he may devour. Sin wants to control. Sin wants to own. Sin wants the power. Sin waits for you to open the door. And, you know, just like the, you know, annoying salesman at your door at the wrong time of the day, like, gets his foot in there. Give the devil a foothold, and he'll shove his foot right in there. And we'll see that's exactly what happened. Right? There's going to be horrible sin that comes along this. And at different moments and at different points, Cain has an opportunity to get right. And that's true for all of us. Like, there's these moments of like, you know, usually sin starts off small. It's just this little small like, ah, I'm just, you know, whatever it is, I'm going to bring this offering. I know it's not the right thing, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to bring it. And you make a little compromise. I know I'm not really supposed to do this, but I'm just going to say it. I'm, I know I'm not supposed to fill in the blank, but I'm just going to. And then what happens? You get called on it. You get caught. Something, you know, goes wrong. And your response, what's your response? Is it like, oh, immediate repentance? Turn back. I'm sorry. I know you're right. I shouldn't have brought that. Or anger, right? And Cain is angry. So he, he follows, he's, he's keeping um, down the wrong path. And his anger now, and the Lord is like, listen, there is sin, it's waiting. It will enslave you. You will do things that you regret if you follow this sin. So verse 8, just as the Lord said, Now Cain talked with Abel his brother, and it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Now, isn't this interesting? You know this story, so it doesn't sound unfamiliar to you. You're like, yep, I, yeah, I knew this. It's not a spoiler to me, Pastor Jason. Like, I knew he was going to kill him. Do you realize the whole prior conversation has been with who? God. He hasn't said anything about Abel. He hasn't talked to Abel until just right now after talking with God. Cain's real problem is God. It's not Abel. Abel brought the right, all Abel did was bring the right thing to the Lord. Abel brought an acceptable sacrifice, a more excellent sacrifice. And instead of being angry with God, Cain takes it out on Abel. And that is so typical. So many times we or they, however you want to play the game, right? People are angry with God. But I'm going to take it out on you, right? I'm, going to, I'm upset with God and, I, and I, I can't believe I've got this, you know, hand dealt to me. I can't believe this situation. I, I can't believe, you know, whatever it is. And Cain's problem was with God, but he persecutes Abel. 
Timothy, 2 Timothy tells us, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Abel just did the right thing. There's going to be times where people are going to come against you because you've done the right thing and they just don't like it because they've got a problem with God. So the best thing for us to do is not take it personal. Don't take it personal because it's probably not about you personally. It may very well be just about God. They're upset with the Lord. He was upset with God and he took it out on his brother. It seems that he had probably taken, lured him out because it says he talked with Abel and then it came to pass when they were in the field. So like, hey, Abel, like, let's go far away from mom and dad. <laughs> let's, let's, let's go out into the field. And then it says he rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Were Adam and Eve bad parents? Well, they did, you know, eat the fruit. Was it, was it bad influence at school? Was he listening to rap music? <laughs> what was the problem? The problem was sin in his heart. That's always the problem. There are influences. There, you know, there are you know, all kinds of influences that happen, but the bottom line is he had sin in his heart, and he made the choice to kill his brother. God warned him that sin was in his heart and wanted to, to overwhelm him, his, control him. And it did, unfortunately. Verse 9 goes on, and then it says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? Again, another question. Is God not sure? Is God like, Hey, wait, uh, one, two, three. There's only three people down there. <laughs> it's not a mystery, but he's drawing him in. Where's your, bo- where's your brother? If you've ever wondered that famous phrase, like, I'm not my brother's keeper, here it is. He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? Sarcasm. (laughs) Right? Right off the bat. Guilty. Just smelling of guilt. Am I my brother's keeper? First sass to the Lord right here. Verse 10. And he said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So, you know, maybe Cain picked up a a rock and killed his brother with it. And there Abel lays in the ground in his blood. And the Lord is like, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me. God is a just God. And he knows what has happened. And he's still reaching out to Cain. He's still calling him talking to him verse 11 this is god's response so now you are cursed from the earth because this blood into the ground this ground that he would would farm in so now you are cursed from the earth which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand when you till the ground it shall no longer yield its strength to you a fugitive and a vagabond you shall be on the earth. So interestingly enough, Cain is not put to death, right? Later in the Old Testament, through the law, like this would be murder. This would be someone put to death. And here the Lord actually just says, You you're going to no longer have a home. You're no longer going to have a place. You 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 are going to go out and, and wander. Verse thirteen, and Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Seriously? (laughs) Really? Like, you killed your brother. You took out a quarter of the population of the earth. (laughs) And you're upset with God because he, he, he sent you out? Like, you can tell his heart is rotten the whole way through. Every one of his responses. My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me out this day from the face of the ground. See, he, he's a farmer. He loves the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that if anyone uh, who finds me will kill me. So obviously we don't know how old he is at this time. And there's other brothers and sisters. There's other nephews and nieces. Like the family is going. Adam and Eve lived for hundreds of years. So at whatever point this is, he's like, listen, somebody is going to kill me. 
he has nothing to say about what he did to Abel. (laughs) He has nothing to say about his own sin. He only gripes to the Lord because he doesn't think it's fair and what's going to happen to me. Um, he's, his, his pity is for himself. And that's a sure sign of an unrepentant heart. A repentant heart is sorry, has sorrow, cares about what happened, sees the, the result of their choices, and, and he has none of that. His eyes are still on himself, not even God's authority. He's not even honoring God in this moment. He's like, am I my brother's keeper? What do I have to keep track of where Abel is? He doesn't agree with God even. God gives him a a merciful consequence. And yet he doesn't, he opposes God's judgment. He doesn't agree with it. He says it's too much. Verse 15, and the Lord said to him, Therefore, whoever kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. In other words, you know, I'm I'm going to protect you. The Lord set a mark on Cain, lest anyone finding him should kill him. This is another, like, you know, topic that people love to guess on. What's the mark of Cain? We have no idea. (laughs) The Bible doesn't say anything about what that mark is. Amuse yourself with whatever idea you want, like big red X, was it the mark of Cain I nobody knows but the purpose was mercy even for Cain God was showing mercy like you're worried about somebody coming to kill you because you they you killed their uncle like okay I am the avenger no one will kill you it'll be avenged sevenfold and I'm going to put a mark on you then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod On the east of Eden. So, in this sense, you remember the Garden of Eden, this perfect fellowship. And then Adam and Eve are driven out from the garden. And now Cain is driven out even further. And the land of Nod, Nod just means wandering. So, Cain is driven out farther away from his father, farther away from his home, farther away from the presence of God. Verse 17. Cain has a wife. It says, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad, isn't that a great name? Irad. Irad. He thinks he's so rad. Sorry, I just got to make sure you're awake. <laughs> to Enoch was born Irad, and Irad begot Mahujiel. Mahujio begot Methushiel, and Methushiel begot Lamech. So here we come to the seventh generation. These, these men are living hundreds of years, and we come down to the seventh generation. So, you know, we're going farther, and we're, and we're following the line of Cain. That's the purpose. It's not to tell all the history. It's not to, you know, show all the different aspects. It's really to follow the line of Cain, the wicked line of Cain. And as we, as we look at this, what I want you to think about, what I want you to just ponder is legacy. We'll go into that next week as well, but legacy. What is the legacy of this unrepentant man? It's sin and more sin and deeper sin. It says, verse 19, now seven generations later, then Lamech took for himself two wives... The name of one was Ada, the name of the second was Zillah, and Ada bore Jabel. He was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all those who play the harp and the flute. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nahamah. So here you've got these sons that begin to bring in, honestly, like technology, right? One uh, harp and flute, another bronze and iron, the other tents and livestock. And so culture and cities and these kinds of things are beginning to be developed. And in this sense, um, you know, with the technology that's being made, it's not wicked, it's not evil, 
It, it just is, right? You, you can make music that glorifies God, and then you can make music that dishonors God. You, you can, you know, make weapons uh, that murder, and you could wait, make, you know, uh, medical supplies that heal. Like, all of this different uses of technology has to do with the heart, not the technology itself. But then we see, here we have Lamech in verse 23. This is the seventh one down. So Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. Wives of Lamech, listen to my speech. For I have killed a man for wounding me, even a young man for hurting me. If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, then Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Isn't that interesting? That's great, right? So now he has left, here, here we have Cain going down seven generations, now we have Lamech, and what does Lamech do? Lamech has turned away from the design of God. Man and wife, leave and cleave, one flesh, you remember that whole study? All of that, he's like, nah, I want two. I'm going to have two wives, Ada and Zillah, some, some commentator, uh, teacher I read, he, he's got women covered A to Z, Ada, Zillah, the whole, you know, like... Two, not just one. So just basically using both of these women, right? Not, not necessarily honoring them, not being united with them. Like, no, two. And then he, he sings this song. People think it's a song or a poem. And he, and he says basically, like, I killed somebody. I killed a young man, a young person, because he hurt me. Right? This is a vengeful, angry Man, who you hurt me, I'm going to kill you. And now he's bragging about it. This, you know, this is your like classic rap song <laughs> right here, right? Like, you killed me, I've got two wives, now I'm going to shoot you and kill. Like, this is a horrible person. This is a messed up man following the line of Cain all the way through. It's not getting better. And then, of course, he brings in this, you know, God gave out of mercy to protect Cain. But he's like, if Cain is avenged sevenfold, then I'm avenged 77-fold. This is the last we hear of the line of Cain. It ends here. Most likely, the rest of the line of Cain dies in the flood, right? The judgment of God comes upon them for their sin all started by their father, Cain, who started bringing the wrong offering to the Lord and refused to repent when he was called and allowed his legacy to be lame. Heck. <laughs> right? Lame legacy of, of using people, of anger, of, of violence, and that, that's the end of Cain's line. But it's not the end of the chapter. Let's look one little bit of hope as we close. Verse 25. And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth. And this is what she says. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. The mourning the loss, no doubt, of her son. Um, but interesting the seed right who this goes all the way to the promise of god about the seed we talked about it on sunday the seed of abraham the seed that eve would have the the that christ would crush the serpent have his heel bruised so god has appointed another seed for me instead of abel whom cain killed and as for seth to him also a son was born and he named him enosh then men began to call on the name of the Lord. Do you see the legacy, the opportunity in the, in the life that we lead? When did men begin to call on the Lord? This godly guy named Seth who raised a godly son. And then men began began to call on the name of the Lord. 
The choices that we make every day in our family matter, right? The choices that we make every day at work matter. On Sunday, as we were talking about the just shall live by faith, the life of faith is what we're called to live every day, and the life of faith leaves a worthy legacy where people have the opportunity to call in the name of the Lord. Yeah, you know, maybe Cain had some like prosperous great, great, great grandchildren, but Seth had a line that will bring the Messiah. Seth has a line that will bring life, and that's what lasts. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word. God, what a powerful reminder of the life of faith that we're called to, the mercy that you show, and yet the, the death that sin brings. We pray that you would draw us close, that our hearts would be soft, that when you speak, we would listen, that when you call, we would come, that when we walk through the valley, that we would keep our eyes on you, that we continue to offer offerings out of our relationship with you, cheerfully giving our hearts and our minds and our lives in a way that gives you glory and brings a legacy of life. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thanks for coming.